Yo, what's good, relatives? Welcome back. This is Kimichi Pili, Six Sun Riders. Want to wish everybody a happy Indigenous Peoples Day. A lot of people, a lot of celebrations taking place in various forms over here in Los Angeles. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful accomplishment having this holiday to replace a colonial, genocidal colonial holiday. But as they say, we can't uh, rest on our laurels, right? And I'm me. I'm serious about my work. Serious about this indigenous reclamation work, this indigenous education work, this equity work, etc. And um, well, it's definitely a beautiful thing and a beautiful accomplishment. You know, I'm always trying to be on the grind. Just want to share my my thoughts and feelings on this day, on this Indigenous Peoples Day, 2024. Share my reflections and thoughts as a long-standing, multi-decade Chicano Indigenous activist here in Los Angeles and California, as well as sharing my uh, things that fill our priorities and things to focus on as we move forward with a lot of this activism. And um, even if people might not consider themselves activists, if you're... Indigenous and you're claiming indigenous and reclaiming yourself as indigenous, reclaiming that identity, reclaiming that label, that already comes with responsibility, regardless of if you view yourself political or not. So again, I just want to offer some thoughts and priorities and things to be vigilant on as we as we move forward. So some of the things we're gonna talk about in this video later on, we're gonna to touch on the idea, the concepts of substance over optics. Um some of my uh, pre and post standing rock reflections and how it affects some of the activism today. Staying value centered, really reflecting on our teachings that we've, we've given and um, not just rep them on our sleeve, but actually put them into practice if we claim ourselves to be Chicano and indigenous activists. Also, white supremacy dynamics, and that's one thing I'm going to be mentioning a lot is really for people to understand what white supremacy is and how it can manifest in our movements and in our lives, as well as having some vigilance and elements to be mindful of regarding ideas and and actions coming out of the academia realm. Again, if uh, thanks for, for showing up, and if you haven't already, please like and subscribe, and I appreciate you all for being here. So again, my name is Mike Bravo, a.k.a. Kimichi Pili. And when I have my glasses on, I'm uh, a.k.a. Chicano Tony Stark. I've been an activist and cultural worker here in Los Angeles, West L.A.-based, Venice-based in particular, but mostly in L.A. And but like I mentioned before, I have done work in uh, across the state and um, in different you know venues and places across the, the country as well with a lot of different organizations. Like I mentioned before, I've been through a lot of a lot of movements, a lot of organizations. I've been exposed to a lot of different teachings, a lot of different concepts, a lot of different, you know, uh, ways of doing things come from the indigenous and Chicano realms. And uh I feel I have a lot of experience as far as really trying to put these teachings and these philosophies and principles into um and implement them into, you know, my politics and these things I work for and, and do in the community and, you know, seeing what, see what stands and see what doesn't fly. And um, I'm hoping some of that uh, experience, some of that hard earned experience can uh, be a benefit to people who are, you know, trying to walk into a more accurate sense of self and identity, um, the indigenous reclamation, the indigenous self-healing, etc. Another fun fact uh, on this occasion of Indigenous Peoples Day in Los Angeles, um, I was actually the first person uh, to submit a motion to get the city of Los Angeles to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. I used to be on the Venice Neighborhood Council. Venice is a neighborhood under the city of Los Angeles. And I was part of Neighborhood Council twice, but on my first... Um, my first term back in 2014 to 2016, I put a motion through um, 
again, the VNC, it's an advi- it's neighbor councils are advisory. We don't have any real decision making power, but we're an advisory board to the city council, which again, LA is a real LA is a beast as far as like the um the scale of, you know, politics and government that it is. When I was on there, I put a motion for them to for the city of LA to recognize Indigenous Peoples Day. And it passed unanimously on the board. And what happens from there, it gets sent to uh, city council, right? And then maybe about a year or two later, Mitchell Farrell uh, picked it up and he ran with yeah, it. But uh, yeah, just a little fun factoid there for you. And again, I want to um, give thanks to everybody who's been, uh, I get, I want to give thanks to everyone who's been showing up here on my videos. This will be the fourth video I think I've made in the last few weeks. I'm still kind of getting a feel for this YouTube thing, kind of experimenting um, with the dynamics here on YouTube. But I want to thank everyone who's tuned in and um, liked and subscribed already. I appreciate you. So far, most of the content here has been um, kind of Mexican-centric, you know, very broad Mexican identity-centric. Uh, but, of course, you know, everything that I try to do here has... Um, I guess a Chicano centric, also Chicano centric identity, uh, indigenous identity resurgent, indigenous healing, um, dynamic and intention here, as to as opposed to let's say the uh, more mestizo minded type of uh, Chicanismo. This is more for those really proud and implementing. And again, I appreciate everyone, who, everyone who's been uh, commenting. I read most of the comments. Not all of them, but I go through them. And I do check them out, and I appreciate a lot of the people with genuine feedback, even the ones who I might not agree with or we might disagree. But uh, I do read them, and there's a lot of good you know, thinkers in there and people who've offered um, some, good, uh, some good different angles and takes on some of the um, things I mentioned as well as um, offerings of certain angles or uh, subtopics I might have missed uh, or forgot to mention. So I appreciate you guys for chiming in. I do read this, and uh, that's one thing I hope to uh, continue on this page is as we talk, like I said, this is not like the end-all, be-all. I don't claim to be like the ultimate know-it-all. I just have a lot of experience, studied for a long time. Like, again, you know, experiential, trying to put things into action. So um, I do my best to, um, you know, talk from an experiential point of view. But yeah, I hope we can continue the, the mutual learning and the mutual exchange. So I appreciate you again. And I want to mention Standing Rock. I wasn't there. But I wanted to mention it because I feel for me in my timeline of activism, um, for me, like a lot of things kind of shifted around that time. Right? So like I mentioned before, I've been doing activism here in LA since about 2001, I want to say. Um, indigenous centric. That's when I really started kind of waking up and and like I said trying to practice and join organizations and go to events and things of that nature but um you know and I've done like you know so many different events so many different organizations around the time the Standing Rock happened at the time I was actually the um, co-director of AIM SoCal the original AIM SoCal and me and my fiance at the time, she was Hopi. She is Hopi. Um, she was out doing Sundance in North Dakota. And the very day that we were coming back from the uh, Sundance is the day that everyone started going up there. And it was like, a, you know, and that was a beautiful phenomenon too. There's a lot of, there's always, you know, pros and cons and, you know, critiques about anything, you know. Um, but it was a beautiful event, you know, it was a beautiful coming together and, you know, uh, awakening and resurgence i guess or like a, of awareness for indigenous people collectively and a lot of people who did go out there i mean it was a lot of sacrifice regardless of they were activists or not or they previously were they previously were or weren't but um the main point i wanted to make is that at least for me in an act as an activist in los angeles i noticed that um you know a lot of social media was you know very popularized via social media and people started to get a lot of like clout, social clout, social capital from their time at Standing Rock. And when all that was said and done, when people came back, 
a lot of people who weren't activists or who never had any record of indigenous activism or partake in any indigenous community work all of a sudden got elevated, got dubbed as indigenous leaders and got exalted in the um, when everybody came back. I'm sure it happened in your city as well. But people came back and so I felt a lot of the long-term, steady, dedicated activists, the ones who, who've been steady doing the work, got kind of sidelined, right? And a lot of this was due to a lot of, you know, you get a lot of uh, white organizations and people want to help out, which is good, you know, having that those resources and having that money and the exposure and whatever. At the same time, there was a lot of activists here getting sidelined, including myself, right? Like... People being exalted at local events, indigenous leader, so and so, and I'm like, well, like, and we're like, who, who, who's this? We never even seen this person, and I guess they happen to live in our neighborhood or close to our neighborhood, and you know, like, and um, of course, like, if people are doing the work, that's good, you know. What I mean, anybody contributing to the work is good, but um, it also became a like the the spirit of. The mischievous spirit of clout chasing got unleashed on the activism world. I felt the you know in particular the indigenous and Chicano activism. So uh, yeah, which but I'm gonna touch on some of those things too uh, as far as some uh, of those dynamics. Again, going back to being substance based and also uh, being mindful of the white supremacy dynamics and how they can manifest within our our movements. So one of the main points. One of the first main points I wanted to touch on was moving away from the optics and being more of substance. Again, too, just using that standing rock situation as an intro. I feel there's too much optical game, right? Too much like um, like the visuals, right? We're all like, especially people coming back into their indigeneity or who get fired up about um, righteous topics, topics that deserve attention. And justice, the optics are real heavy. You know, we're always, you know, we get excited. We want to express ourselves and, you know, wear our, you know, you know, our certain T-shirt, you know, and, you know, oh, you know, uh, you're on Indian land or, or, you know, there's so many different T-shirts out there, right? That are dope and, you know, and badass and we want to represent, oh, yeah, let me, let me put a, a feather in my hair or whatever, things of that nature too. You know, it's, it's beautiful to, you know, I, I remember how it feels to, you know, get the, you know, can really feel it in your heart and your spirit, like, ah, oh, like let that indigenous energy out, you know? Um, but like anything too, like any relationship, uh, you know, things can turn bad, you know, and, uh, or turn negative, like, you know, with alcohol, for instance, right. You know, you can have a beer or drink every so often, but then like, you know, there's a point where it gets harmful. You're drinking too much and you're getting a little too inebriated with, you know, certain things. So in this case, you know, the optics of things, right. And then it becomes a competition. Who can, who, who, who can wear the bigger jade? Who, who has the... More this, more that, and like I said, dude, it's a balance. We want to, it's it's good not to get caught up in that. You might people might not view it that way, but the more like the I'm more indigenous than you game that I'm more indigenous competition game, right? But let's say in the optic realm, right? Like you know, of trying to outdo each other. Yeah, so getting more into substance. What are you actually about? You know, what teachings are you really learning? Like, what are you really learning, and what what teachings are you trying to implement? And how are you really showing up for indigenous issues beyond the, uh, you know, the visual representation and the, you know, the fist in the air and the selfies and, you know, uh, yelling something, you know, at a protest or what have you. You know, those are all parts of, of, you know, expression and what have you. But, you know, like really it comes down to like, how are you walking? How are you? What are you implementing? What are you trying to create for the next generations? It has to be really noted that there's a lot more. It's imperative to notice too. It's, there's so much more going on in activism, in indigenous activism, in the indigenous education fronts, all that, uh, than what you see on social media. Um, there's especially in recent times, you know, with certain people getting you know caught up with law enforcement and things like that. There's so many posts I've seen where people really think that. There's only there's only, only the people on social media who have bigger followings are the ones 
are the only ones doing the work. You know, I'll hear things like, oh, there's no one else doing stuff for our people. And it's like, there's so many people out there doing that, doing work. They don't, but a lot of them are not on social media or they're, they're not really popular on social media or what have you too. So you got to know there's a lot of work being done that's on, that's not on social media. And one of the downsides of social media too is, and I've seen this with, again with, you know, uh, certain prominent people who, who've gotten caught up in different situations where it, it seemed like the, their ego, because of the lack of teachings and because of the lack of indigenous substance, ego seemed to kind of take over where it became more about the likes and the attention and uh, going the extra mile and uh, getting the extra clickbait to uh, you know keep your likes versus like just doing the work and reaping you know the beauty and the benefits that come from you know just being a uh, a humble servant for the people it became more about the likes and the image and that's another example that I that I mean about that I mean that I'm referring to when I talk about having substance over over optics as well as the optics of being from an organization right and this is something I tell people a lot of times that I talk to I Highly, I won't say discourage, um, but I'm highly, when people ask me about, you know, joining certain organizations or doing certain things, I try to tell people stay away from the big popular organizations. Like, you know, maybe support events they're doing, they're kind of peep game and whatever. But um, there's, you know, popular organizations out there, Chicano organizations, American Indian organizations or whatever too, and they're all dope and a lot of them have been around for a long time. But a lot of those, in my opinion, their their branding and their image gets in way. It, it overshadows their work. If you take away the branding and whatever history their organization might have or their broader organization, because a lot of times these are just these actual organizations are just like chapters, right? But if you take away all the you know all the regalia and the uniforms or whatever, they're just regular people like me and you, uh, learning and trying to do right. You know, so don't. Um, don't uh, I would say don't exalt or put anybody on the pedestal or just because they you know got certain branding or are part of certain organizations you know it's everybody's at the end of the day everyone's human and we're all just trying to do the best that we can again too I know it's fun you know to represent and get the regalias too and you know and I know that good feeling of wearing a uniform and being in a certain dress code and doing your thing too but like which leads to the next point which is to really sincerely reflect on our teachings and our values and our spiritual practices right you know we're all part of a learning process we're all learning and i guess i can be a little bit of a grump maybe or a little just a not a grump but i guess like i said i've been through a lot of scenarios and a lot of disappointments a lot of highs and lows there's a lot and there's people who've been in the movement as long as i have or longer and it's real disappointing to be in situations that I would think we wouldn't have to correct people. And it's like, you know, we're all, you know, we're always kind of people make mistakes and we're always trying to learn or we have our blind spots, right? That comes with the territory always. At the same time, there's basics and fundamentals that um, shouldn't be questioned or shouldn't be of any issue. um, That shouldn't require any kind of second thinking. Like for instance, like when we're dealing with uh, child molesters, chomos, right? people supporting chomos or uh, people committing like like legit receipts for you know acts of, of violence against women like non-nuanced straight black and white you know dynamic situations no nuanced right and these are all teachings that basic teachings that we have you know at the very least it's disappointing because we have teachings to guide us and to think like wow these people like for as much as they're they're rapping whoop de whoop they're all whoop de whoop talking about how they just say they got the J's or Super like they're you know like their whole presentation is super like well, like mega indigenous, right? But over here they can't even follow the teachings or they can't even support their own people trying to look for, call for justice, right? Under the guise of like, um, and there's a couple of terms to look up too: toxic positivity, and I guess maybe spiritual bypassing. So toxic positivity is basically where you bring forth a, uh, a dynamic or a situation that's not positive for the moment and it gets dismissed or um they tell you to get over it basically in some form or fashion in order to keep the you know the 
the optics and the the presentation of the moment, right? So in these cases, like, there's people I know who do events, right? Big popular events here in LA. Oh yeah, indigenous this whoop de whoop, you know, concerts and what have you too. But it comes time to like, hey, you know, this this dude was enabling, this dude was attacking women who were trying to protect themselves against a, some fucking sexual predator, right? All receipts for and whatever and well known situations. Oh yeah, but we don't really want that drama here. Oh yeah, or just you know, just some kind of excuse or making excuses for these people, or, or, or even kind of like second tier, enabling them from accountability or conversations, you know, that they need to own up to. Again, like serious things, not just like beefs or, you know, trivial items like real deal, community safety and integrity issues, right? Again, these are people who have like you know the good optics and presentations of being indigenous and uh, you know visually, and they talk about it whoop de whoop. But at the end of the day, like they're enabling some of the biggest harm to enter our uh, community, right? Again, via the toxic positivity. Maybe it's low key related to the previous dynamics I mentioned about um, you know maybe standing rock dynamic, toxic positivity. And being value centered, being substance centered, and I guess it low key connects to what I was saying earlier, a little bit with the you know substance over optics, and some of the standing rock dynamics that I mentioned, and that goes back to again I'm always gonna repeat this. There's a lot, I, a lot of the items here that I'm talking about. I'm probably gonna repeat them. I probably already mentioned it before, and I'm gonna repeat them throughout a lot of these um, these videos. Um, and one of those things is to really understand what white supremacy is. People don't really understand what white supremacy is beyond like the typical like neo Nazi KKK manifestations of white supremacy. But it's really critical to understand what white supremacy is and how it moves and shape shifts within um, the, um, certain contexts, right? And of course, in this context, we're talking about um, indigenous activism, Chicano activism. And a lot of times, too, when you get this exposure, you get this attention, again, some of these situations that I mentioned about people and their toxic positivity is because they're having, you know, it's something money-based, business-based that they have. They have an indigenous-themed product or indigenous-themed business, right? And a lot of times, you know, it's we want to support that, 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 you know, that indigenous economy however we can. But at the same time, we really have to reflect on the, the values and, and how much are we really strained from our traditions and our teachings, but with that business and money dynamic, even if it's like uh, raising money or nonprofit stuff, they're doing noble causes. When we when start getting that money in, uh, that white money in, you bring in that white power dynamic more than it's already probably existing in, on our peripheral. And then sometimes our, the real things that need to get done, the imperatives that need to happen for our people and our communities, um, a lot of times that can negatively or adversely affect our priorities because of that white money and trying to uh, appeal to the white gaze. And the white gaze is another important term for y'all to understand as well. The white gaze refers to the dominant perspective through which white people as the holders of cultural and societal power view and interpret the world, often imposing their values, norms, and biases onto people of color. It frames non-white experiences in ways that cater to white audiences, distorting or erasing the authenticity of those experiences to fit white expectations or comfort. This dynamic reinforces white supremacy by making whiteness the standard for how others are perceived and understood. And again, so this is, you know, again, breaking down white supremacy and how it forms in all ways. Is, that's beyond the scope of this video, but again, I'm always going to, encourage you to study and, and learn. Friends, I was just thinking, uh, I just saw a brother, um, Douglas Miles, I think his name is Apache Skateboards. Shout out to Apache Skateboards. And uh, he was just talking about how, you know, he just got this really big deal with Zoomies. His, his, his skateboards and his clothing line got uh, uh, distribution at Zoomie stores, which is like a, you know, like an urban streetwear store. Um, I know there's a lot in California. I'm assuming they're, you know, Southwest. I'm not too sure how extensive they are. But anyways, a real dope accomplishment, you know. Real good, like I said, again, supporting our indigenous economy, our indigenous business people, true to the values and, you know, staying on point with the traditions 
as best they can and not trying to skirt or sell out our tradition. It's a pretty big, uh, momentous uh, situation, and he was remarking how all the major native news out outlets didn't even cover it or give him like no love or no shine for it. Again, too, a lot of times these news places, these news outlets, and speaking about some of the, I guess, Native American or American Indian ones that are out there, I'm sure they, they talk about a lot of good stuff, right? But then again, there's politics behind allowing or not allowing certain voices to be heard or seen or, or uh, lifted, right? And again, that's because I think of that, you know, the white power, that white money, that white supremacy dynamic via, you know, donors. As far as white supremacy goes, again, um, one of the things, another thing I would be vigilant about is the sidelining of, how do I say it? The sidelining of brown, red, because brown and red are the same thing. It's just, you know, Chicanos use brown and American Indians tend to use the term red, but... The sideline of brown, the sideline of brown identities, imagery, and priorities in favor of identities and initiatives that decenter or divert energy away from uplifting or taking away from the signals of brown identity, brown priorities, which is to say indigenous priorities, and that lend themselves to whiteness and white power dynamics so some things to be mindful of quick notes and this is you know nothing exhaustive but just some quick things that stand out to me is a lot of the imposition of the latinx terminology on spanish-speaking indigenous people as well as in a lot of media this uh, kind of uh, anglo and black um, indigenous optics when it comes to indigenous representation as well as the LGBTQ movement, or any identity or political initiative that is connected to, connected or more oriented to American identity dynamics. And that de-emphasizes signals and priorities of indigenous communities. Again, as I said before, inclusivity is important, but we also have to be mindful and honest about ways that's used to erase and marginalize indigenous people. Again, that's a whole probably can of worms right there, and we can explore that in a different conversation. But uh, just some quick notes I wanted to to mention real quick. Next is keeping an eye, keeping a critical critical eye on academia. Um, there's a lot of kind of um, there's a lot of questionable. Elements coming out of there. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the uh, the Mecha Mepa dynamic, right? Where they try to change the name of, of Mecha, which I think they did. I think most of the chapters bought into it. Uh, and again, too, I, I don't want to like um, throw the baby out with the bathwater because you know there's a lot of dope things coming out of academia and studies and people doing and work. But again, going back to you know having a experiential, practical knowledge is really helpful and I think maybe a lot of it's just kind of misguided and um, there's discrepancies that come with lack of experience and that's my guess but uh, yeah as far as like that MEPA dynamic and noticing a lot of people even other indigenous Mexicans who go to academia they all come out with this like anti-Chicano anti-Mexican sentiment again um goes back to what I feel are people not really understanding what the fight's about, right? Not really understanding white supremacy and how it works and how it manifests. And um, with some of these valid critiques or these valid um, complaints we have between different contingents of our indigenous communities or Mexican indigenous communities or Chicago communities, uh, we're not stopping to really think about how a lot of the language and stances we might be taking are lending themselves to to white supremacy. And as a, I guess, a spinoff of some of those elements coming out of academia, a lot of it is, um, it tries to discourage Chicanos from uh, engaging in and advancing on Recovering their indigenous face, right? Their indigenous self, their indigenous healing path. And like I mentioned before, there's ways to express um, 
critiques or concerns about certain dynamics and certain contexts, but ultimately anybody who's doing uh, discouraging our connection to indigeneity, our healing and indigenous roots is just doing the work of the colonizer. And I got some articles on the website, Six Sun Riders again, talking about some of this. Uh, the brother Curry Tlapoyawa, he has a good article on that. And there's a link in my website on the uh, the main the first page we have, or one of the first teachings about not Hispanic, not Latino. There's some links at the bottom, and there's a couple of articles from uh, the brother Curly Tlapoyawa. Shout out to Curly. And I believe Ruben over at, um, was it Chimali Media doing the Tales from Aslantis? You know, even though we don't agree on a lot of stuff, I think we agree more than not. So, uh, again, shout out to Curly and Ruben. And I encourage people to go check out the Tales from Aslantis podcast. And, and I guess last but not least, I really encourage, you know, I guess on the note of, of substance and moving this forward, you know, like, again, you know, it's in this people's day. Let's celebrate and do all that too. But uh, again, I'm the type of person, you know, I'm not just there for the party. I'm there for the work and I'm there for the struggle. I'm not just there for, you know, when it's time to show up on stage and show how much, uh, you know, how indigenous I am. It's about the work, work doing the healing, the self-work, doing the sacrifice for the community. That's the true way. That's the best way that you show up and show your indigenous, how indigenous you are. It's not about the jewelry and the optics. You know, that's beautiful too. But again, so on that note, I really encourage people to try to get involved in some form of local government. I think I mentioned earlier, I was part of the neighborhood council here in Venice, neighborhood council under City of LA, and I've been on different, you know, little school boards here and there. But um, and if you don't have that where you're at, there's got to be some type of, you know, neighborhood council or some kind of school advisory board, the park, maybe a uh, park advisory board or any kind of like little even like, you know, Boys and Girls Club, whatever, any kind of like small institutional library type organizations, you know, like I really would really, really encourage you to to find something like that and get involved. And if you're not really too interested in it, you know, but the main lesson being just to really get a good taste for how how politics work. You know, you might, it might not be the full-fledged experience some of them I have like in the city council or whatever, but you get a good you get a really good taste about how people work, uh, you know, some of the dynamics of um of building power and how to get things done. Cause a lot of times too we get caught up in this, you know, fist in the air and yeah, you know, and uh you're on native land and, you know, Chicano power and, you know, we you know we have that pride. When we, there's no shortage of the pride, but there's I feel there's a big shortage of the implementation, right? And again, it's it's um, lack of experience, and you know, uh, just lack of experience, and maybe impractical expectations based off what you don't know. But if you get into any type of like little advisory board, or even if it's just for like a season, you know, or the more the better, um, you get a real taste for how politics work, how decisions are made, and the ways to kind of like show up and how like how to balance out and get things done. Not to get, not so much to get involved in the politics per se, but just to know how things work and how decisions are made and how you can position yourself to to best influence policy changes, uh, resource redirection, um, and all that, you know. Again, at the very least, if not... Actually, not so much as a career, but just for the experience and understanding, I think that would do well. Cause I feel a lot of people they don't really understand a lot of how the politics work, and we get mad at things. And yeah, you know, we have right right to be mad and the right to critique things and protest, whatever too. But at the same time, if you're not trying to build power and change policy, and or really trying to figure out how to mobilize uh, in some form or fashion in a practical way, um. You know, it's, it's just going to wear you out and burn you out, you know. So I highly encourage people to get involved. And uh, I'm open to anybody, you know, I'm open to, you know, offering advice or uh, if anybody wants to embark on that type of endeavor or they are, any kind of tips or things to watch out for, techniques and things of that nature. So, um, yeah, that's the last thing I want to leave it at. And, again, just uh, these are just my quick takes. Um 
and happy Indigenous Peoples Day, and let's move forward. Let's create something.